anything led him to put that six right there? Why is that six there? Hmm. Uh, go with one of the P's? Well, I think you, you're right, or not quite. It should be able to stop. Okay, good. So because when you distribute, right, what you get is 6p times p equals 6p squared. So we need that. We need to wind up with 6p squared when we, when we distribute. And that is, uh, you know, that happened. And we get the ones here, similar reason. 1 times 1 is 1. So it's all working out. But why is 6 incorrect? Can I work out what you write that looks like? You might say to yourself, I know why. Right? I don't have to write it down. But if you write it down, you, you, in, in your memory, there's a video of you writing this down on a piece of paper. One more. Research has actually been done. <laughs> you just said research says that if we see it and we do it and we say it and write it and hear it, and all the different things that we can do, all the different ways in which we can. Immerse ourselves in the learning, the more it sticks. Uh, okay, so why is 6 not correct? Why? I mean, 6p times p makes uh, 6p squared, and 1 times 1 is 1. So why is it ultimately, ultimately wrong? The whole, mm, well, the whole thing is wrong because you can't. Can't factor it? No. Why not? Because the one is a prime number. Yeah. And so, you know, when you know when you find out when you try to dispute it and stuff like that, it won't uh, fit together. So that means that the whole thing is wrong. You're saying uh, you can't multiply to get one, and also do what else? And then also add it together and get five. Okay. Anybody have anything else to say to that? Well, you know, that's, that's what we used to do. In, in the, previous, the previous section, the section before this one, that's what we were asking ourselves. What multiplies to make this and adds mm -hmm. to make this, right? But, but this one does you multiply A times C. So now we're going to multiply this times that. So it won't just be this number plus that number. We have other numbers in front of P, right? Yeah, one. This one does, but this one has a six. Yeah. So let's see what happens. We get uh, 6p squared, right? We get 1. We also get 6p plus p. Right? 6 times 6p times 1 is 6p, and 1 times p is 1p. Well, 1 plus 1 is 2, right? So you would you would think, Tyler, by your reasoning, that we would wind up getting a 2p here. We don't. We get a 7p. Oh, yeah. Because this isn't the only thing seven. that goes in front of p. This now. Now that we have a number in front of p squared that's not just one, you have to add the then you have to add the number that's in front of p and the other number. Right, you have to add the products of yeah. Um, well, it's wrong because when you distribute, you don't. possible to factor in such a way that we, when we do distribute, we do get the original expression? Like with this problem? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's fine. Uh, if you factor 5. If you factor 5? Five, five, 
factor five p. Well, the five p, that that p term right there is going to get is going to be the result of this times that plus this times that. And so that number is not going to be just a purely a product. It's going to be the sum of two numbers. Well. other way to factor say three times two. Uh, three p times two p does give us six p squared, and one times one does give us one. Three p times one gives us three p. One times two p gives us two p. And that does add together to give oh. five p. Oh. There we go. There's the correct thing. You gotta look at all the possibilities. You could do six times one. We can also do, also do three times two. We gotta skip that one. Okay. What? I was just gonna say, can I write that down for a second? Uh, give me one more second. And I think that one goes from the on the line. Okay. You guys see the in internship? So here we go, Jennifer, now do it for work, not Marty. Jennifer's taking a crack at it. And she factored it that way. She chose four, negative four, why'd she do that? Why'd she choose four, negative four? What's so confident about that one? I told Jennifer that was right. So write it to yourself, write it oh. in your notes to yourself, or to a friend. And put these in the bottle. So by my count, there's maybe a couple things, a couple reasons why. Anybody give us one? Anything? Four times negative four is negative 16. Four times negative four is negative 16. That is something we want, we want to have happen. Uh, so four times negative four is negative 16. Something we definitely want. Any other reason why four negative four? When you multiply the four times n and the negative four times n, you get four n minus four n, which is zero n, right? That's what we want. So we've got 49 n squared, we got a negative 16, and in the place of n, there's nothing. There's a zero times n. So when we combine like terms, we want to get zero n. And uh, negative four n squared does that, okay? So, uh, well, let's just say four n minus four n equals zero n. So it seems like a lot of things, she's got a lot of things going for her, or this, this answer has a lot of things going for it. Why is, that, why is Jennifer's factorization the correct one? copy and paste our answer from, from here, because when you distribute, you don't get the original. It's not going to be the same answer. Uh, blah, 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 don't get original. Just like before. So what would give us the original is 7n plus 4 times 7n minus 4. Think of another example that factors just like this. 
where where you have a number out in front that's not just one. We can come up with another example of a factor just like that. Not, I mean, not just like that, not seven n plus four, seven n minus four, I mean, similar to that. But it, so it, it um, doesn't have a middle term, right? It has a, a zero x or a zero n or whatever. And this number out in front here is not just one. And so two things. Square variable is not just one. So it's just like 36 n squared minus 12. 36 n squared minus 12. Do you know what network that's where? Yeah. Oh, it factored. Six. N6 n. N6 n. Minus, or plus uh, 6 minus 2. 6 minus 2. Does that give us 36 n squared? Put it all put together, okay. Uh, does it give us negative 12? Pretty constant. Does it give us zero n? What, what do we get for n? We get uh, six times negative two is negative 12. Negative 12 n. And six times six, that's 36 n, so no. There's 24 n. We need those, those two n terms with the opposites so that when we add them together, we get a zero. What's that? 25. 25? No. Instead of 12? Yeah. Minus 25. Let's go back and change that. What difference is that going to make? This will be 30 n, but what's this going to be? Oh, negative 30 n. Uh, X. All right. So, what kind of numbers do we need here and here? Square roots. Yeah. Square. Well, squares. Ones that have square roots. Yeah. It's the only way to get all those things that we want. Right. To get a zero term in the middle. Um, for this number not to be a one. Uh, in order to get two, I, two opposite numbers, right? Uh, in this case, 30 and negative 30. Um, we have to have two, uh, two sets of parentheses that have the same numbers, six and six, five and five. And then these are opposites, plus and minus. <coughs> so this as it was called the other day, is also called a difference of two squares. Difference of two squares, just like the other day, where we had n squared, you know, we came up with an example, n squared minus 100, n squared minus 49, n squared minus 36. Uh, it, it also holds up if this number in front is, if it's other than one, it needs to be a square number. on this problem. Uh, I'm not doing it all the way correctly. Uh, this is in the part circled in blue. What is Emmett doing here? What is going on with that stuff in blue? What's he working on? How's he doing it? Why is he doing it? Absolutely anything you write down there. Partially right. I want you to write first.
there's quite a bit going on there. So um, I think there's a multifaceted answer. But what do you have? Any chance anywhere? What's going on? Here? Zero, eight times yeah. two. Okay. This is what he's doing, like the process. So remember that a, a quadratic in standard form is ax squared plus bx plus a is also always multiplied by x squared, b is always multiplied by x, and c is always the, the local constant. So when you say a, c, you mean the, the thing times x squared times the constant. That's our negative 30, right? 6 times negative 1. And you put the b on the bottom. The b down here. Yeah. And then you find um, what adds up to 30, negative 30. Adds to negative 30. Other way around. So it does what to get to 30? Multiply. Multiply to get negative 30. And then add to 7. Add to 7. Okay. Uh, okay. Good. That's how we did it. That's what he did, right? That's what the process looks like. You multiply A times C. And then you write down B. You find two numbers that multiply to make this number that you found by multiplying A and C. And then add to make whatever B is. Great. So that's how this is done. Why is it? What are we looking for? What do we get out of all that? Did all that work? And, and out of that work, what did what information have we pulled back into our equation solver? The negative ten and the three. That's what we get out of this, right? So. Let's go back to the beginning. Let's, let's say we know we're going to split up the negative 7 into two things. Two things that add up to make negative 7. Now there's literally millions and billions and trillions of ways to take two numbers and add to make negative 7. Right? And if you know about the rest of the process, then you realize like it's important which numbers we choose because when we uh, factor this group into that group and that kind of thing. Uh, we want to make sure that these two parentheses end up being identical. If they're not identical, we did something wrong. Or, uh, yeah, we did something wrong. So how do we know? How do we know which numbers are the right numbers? How do we know negative 10 and 3? Well, this whole process tells us that. That's what this is all about. Okay. So A times C, write down B. Two numbers that multiply to make AC and add to make Um, so he's just uh, finding uh, negative 10 and 3, uh, and we found, uh, or we discussed the way in which he does that, how he does that. So once he's done that, he's found negative 10 R and 3 R, split up negative 7 into the, the sum of those two like terms. What comes next? How do we go from here to there? What just happened between here and there? Okay, uh, how, how to get that answer? Like um, two, uh, two r times three r equals six r squared. Yeah. And then the same thing for two r my, uh, minus five is negative ten r. So two r times negative five is negative ten. So, yeah. so we see why they're the same, right? And we, we can see how to get from here to there. What's that process called, getting from here to there? Distributing. Distributing. So what would you call it to go from here to there? Undistributing. Sure, right? It's as good as anything else. One way is distributing, the other way is undoing that, undoing the, the distribution, okay? It's a beautiful way to, to, to think about it. It works just fine. Now, the actual words that we use um, that are more widespread, you'll see it in a math book or whatever that math teachers or math teachers can talk about. Was, well, we're factoring out a 2R, okay? So right, undistributed 2R, factor out a 2R, factor out the common binomial 2R, okay? But that word factor, that's, that's what's more common to use. But you could just as easily say undistributed 2R. Can someone Explain to us what it means to undistribute that 2R. Besides Tyler, because he already did. Someone else? 
but else explain the Bavarian word or the established root as well? Uh, you take two r out of the six r minus ten r. Six r squared minus ten r. Yeah. Okay. You take it out. something uh, that both of these like, could have factored out of them. So that when you distribute back into it, you get this. Something that they have in common. This, you can multiply something by two and get this, and also multiply something by two and get this. They have that factor in common. Uh, more than that, you, you could also multiply something by r, something out there, multiply by r gives you six r squared. Also something times r gives you negative 10 r. So that's a common factor, those are two common factors that they have. Uh, two times r can be distributed into some parentheses to get six r squared minus 10 r. Okay, and that's it, there's, there's nothing bigger. If, if there was something bigger, then we would find that we could factor out something again from these two things. Two r is the biggest, that's, that's the most we're gonna get. We're undistributing that two r. Tyler, do you have something else to add? I'm just, no, no. no. Um, and here, what's the biggest thing that, that both of these can have factored out of them? One. A one. So the biggest thing they have in common is one. The biggest thing I can put out, I, outside of the parentheses and distribute it and get 3r minus 5 is just one. I can only distribute a one into it. So we've got questions about from here. its own little factorization. This group got its own little factorization, and then we add them together. They were being added together before, we're adding, adding them together still. Well, just like we undistributed this 2r, we factored out this 2r, we're going to do the same thing again. We're going to undistribute something that they have in common. The thing they have in common here, these two terms that matter, is 3r minus 5. Same way that we undistribute this 2r from here and from here, we can undistribute the 3r from this term and from this term. So we could distribute it back in like this. And that's what's happening here. We're undistributing the 3r minus 5. There it is. There it is. Just like there's the 2r outside the parentheses here that we can distribute. Get rid of that. We can distribute the 3r minus 5 back into here with the 2r plus 1 distribute the 3r minus 5 to the 2, or the 2r, we distribute it to the 2r, we get 2r times 3r minus 5. We're multiplying 2r by 3r minus 5. We just do the 2r first, because multiplication is commutative. It doesn't matter which order we multiply. And we distribute the 3r minus 5 to the 1, we get 3r minus 5 times 1. same way we can distribute this common factor of 3r minus 5 to this term and to this term, we get 2r times that factor and 1 times that factor. Just like we get 3r times 6r and negative 5 times 2r. questions you can ask about it, if you have any questions about it, go ahead and shoot. Yeah, Tyler. Um, did you, uh, how did you get the negative 10 and the neg and the uh, 3? Just the so it goes back up to here in this, in this blue circle. How we got the negative 10 and 3 is first the AC. Here, I'll, I'll uh, take this black right here. 
and I'll write like the thing that you can do the same every time for each factorization problem. Yeah, I just don't get what and the negative thirty and stuff. Is that just like the take a negative ten three and times it? The the a we get the negative thirty by taking a times c. A is six, and c is negative five. Mm -hmm. Six times negative five gives us a negative thirty. And then b is just negative seven. We just bring that guy over here all the time. So when we get the negative ten and the three, is we find two numbers that multiply to make negative thirty and add to make negative seven. Okay, I gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, that's some good factorization. I did a good job, and it factored correctly, right? You see there. And the second question says, "See, as Emmett found the correct factorization, why has he not correctly solved the equation?" Got a little note for yourself on that topic. Is that it being correct? Why is it found the solution? What do you mean it doesn't it doesn't go to zero? Don't wait, ten minus six, it doesn't go to zero. Oh, well, don't we need to know what r is? Yeah, we gotta plug something into the r, right? So why is it that Emmett why has he not found the solution? something we thought was a solution, we plug it back in to check, yeah. right? But how do we get to having the solution? Factorization of seven months? Well, if we did that, if we multiplied it all together, then we wind up like somewhere above what we, like we would like be undoing what we did, yeah. like all that work that we did. Um, so factoring it would just be forced in. Um, to find, to solve the equation, all we have to do is say what r is. Right, that's, we have to get down to where r is equal to this and, and maybe something else. Maybe all the ones that were a thing. And in this case, I think five and negative one. Five and negative one? Mm -hmm. I, I think r is equal to five and negative one. How do you find that? Well, um, I'm not sure if I'm doing it right, actually, but basically just So here, last time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. So here's the the simple answer. Like you just didn't finish. Yeah. You're not done yet, right? He needs to find what r is. He needs to finally make a statement. R equals this. R equals that. Okay. To do that, don't get, don't let yourself get uh, confused here. Um, in previous sections, all you had to do when you got to the, like this stage was say five negative one. Right. The opposite of the number three. Be careful because that's not really what you're doing to find the solutions. Here's what we're doing. We, in the next step, what we're actually going to do is set, I can do these parentheses, I don't know if these parentheses work. This equal to zero and this. Why would I say that? Why would I say 3r minus 5 is equal to 0? How do I know that? How do I know that has to be true? Because it equals 0 before. So how do I know that this has to be 0? Right, because we got c 
zero, how did we get zero? What well, operation did we use? <laughs> well, there's four basic operations. Add, subtract, multiply, divide. Uh, what, what operation did we use to get zero? Multiply. Yeah, we multiply this times that. We can look into that. We, we can kind of break it down lots of different ways. But that's one way we can do it. Is the number of times the number got zero. And if you didn't multiply by zero, then you can't get zero. You have to multiply by zero to get zero. So that had to be zero. Either we multiplied that by zero, and that was zero. Or we took this and multiplied it by zero, and, and that had to be zero. And then we solve. We add five, divide by three. Subtract one, divide by two. So five thirds or negative one half. If you go back to the days of simple equation like uh, 3 plus r equals 5. It was easy, right? It was 2. Clearly it was 2. And uh, I made this, this point a, a little bit because uh, a lot of times people don't want to show their work. They don't want to say, well, I have to subtract 3 on both sides and that kind of thing. They can just see the answer is 2. Of course the answer has to be 2. How else could you add 3 to something and so we go from the days where it seems so obvious to, you know, even if there's fractions in there, maybe you can just figure that out by looking at it. But you look at this equation, and you try to figure, I mean, you'd be lucky if the, the numbers that go in here were like whole numbers, like even if the answer was 2 or negative 5, that would be hard enough to figure out. But we come and we find out that the answers are 5 thirds. Who's going to think to try 5 thirds? or negative one half. So we go from the days of the super obvious to, I don't even know if I want to try to guess what the answers to this would be, or the solutions would be, because I could try forever and, and never get it um, if I'm really unlucky. But through a, a fairly simple process, and through some basic ideas, like it's possible to write this as two things times each other, and if I'm so clever as to leave the other side zero, then that times that equals zero means each one of these has to be equal to zero, making the solution quite simple to find. We're just solving these really simple linear equations. These equations that were easy like way back in the day were really easy. So it's these kinds of things, the, the, the idea that we could use these fairly basic ideas, take something that seems so complex, complex or complicated and, and boil it down to simpler and simpler until you took this divide both sides by three and find out r is five thirds. And now we found this number that if you plug it in, you square it, and you multiply it by six, and then you multiply it by negative seven, you add those together, you subtract five, you'll get zero. So that's pretty easy. That was pretty awesome to me. Those are the kinds of things that I liked about math a lot. You've got this complicated looking So here we are, the next one. So Clara is doing some work. She's done this correctly, everything correctly. The very beginning, you see Clara adds 5x squared to both sides and subtracts 20p from both sides. Okay. The, the thing is not to look at this like as a whole thing, as if you're supposed to know how to do every step of it. First thing that she does is to add 5x squared to both sides and subtract 20p to both sides. Just think about that, just that one part. Why did she do that? Okay. that for a second.
Why did she, why did she do that? What good did that do her? Jeff, Tyler? It puts a zero on the one side. Is that important? Yes. Why? Because, you know, like on the other side, you know, like before, when you get down to the, uh, when you have two. Like before, like the last problem? Yes. Like this problem back here? Yes, you want to uh, have it on the zero, uh, one side zero. Yeah. So when you get down to the bottom, it's easy, and that's uh, you just have to find the two parentheses that will equal zero. Exactly, because it equals zero, and that's useful because when we get down to this part right here, uh, and, and as uh, as Keaton pointed out, when we multiply two things together, we got zero. One of those things had to be zero. Now, if we didn't start off at the beginning and get this side to be zero, we would have who knows what over here, right? Which may have made this actually impossible to factor. So if we didn't have zero over here, then that's a big mess. Then factoring it wouldn't even help. Because the key point to all this is that it equals zero. And only zero, zero is the only number that you can say, if I multiply two numbers together to get zero, I know one of them has that doesn't work for 1, or 2, or 80, or negative numbers. It only works for 0. It has to be that one of these is 0 if the answer was 0. Right? That's like a Magellan equation. Does that make sense? If it doesn't equal 0, if you go through all the trouble to factor it, even if we're lucky enough that it does factor without having to add it to equal to 0, well, then we can't say each one of them has to be equal to something. And only 0 does that. Okay. Uh, let's see, so that when she factors, we can set each factor equal to zero. This is such a good idea. Okay. Uh, so you see, in the red circle, we did the same thing as we did in the previous problem. The A times the C, write down B, to find the two numbers and multiply the AC and MB. Rather than doing that, rather than doing that, Clara had taken a different approach. Could she try it a different way? Yeah, she could. I'm not saying it's logical, but she could have just taken the basic guess and check way and gone forever. Guess and check, well, it's possible. Gone forever. Let's find out how far she would have to go if she was like really unlucky. The guess and check way. Let's remind ourselves what that looks like. Okay. We're starting off. Well, we, we've added 5x squared and subtracted 22 to both sides to set us up with this nice looking equation equals to 0. Okay. So we're at 18x squared plus 21x minus 22. And we know we want to get to a point where it's factored, where it's in two parentheses. Right? So we'd like it to be in two parentheses like that. Now, it's this 21x that kind of is giving us a little bit of trouble. We know that we're going to have an x term and another x term, and we multiply those together, what are we going to get? x squared. And what's the number in front of that x squared going to have to be? It's going to have to be this guy right here. It's going to have to be 18. But the good news is that's the only way to get x squared is x times x. When we multiply these two parentheses together, x squared is not going to come from anything else but x times x. So it's got to come out to be 18. So there's not too many different ways for that to happen. There could be 18 and 1. Uh, or, could be a different color. Could be, could we do it a different way? How else could we do it? 2 and 9. 2 and 9, 2x. And 9x would multiply make 18x squared. But then again, 6x and 3x. OK, that's not too bad. Let's just but what comes next is finding these other two numbers, right? We know that when we multiply these two numbers together, what number do we have to wind up getting when we multiply together? Mm -hmm. When we multiply just the number times the number, we should get negative 22. Negative 22. How can you multiply to get negative 22? What's that? 2 and 11? 2 and 11. Two and 11. Oh, but one has to be negative, okay. So two and negative 11. Or but maybe it's negative two and positive 11. But then again, then again, maybe it's 11 and negative two over here. Or but maybe it's 11 and positive, negative 11 and positive two over there. 
But that's not even, well, that's about half of it. That is the half of it, because we can also do 22 and 1. Oh, but one of them has to be negative, so it could be negative 22, and positive 1, or it could be 1 here, negative 22 here, or it could be negative 1 here, and positive 22 here. But what if none of those combinations work with 18x and x? Then you have to go over and do it a uh, whole bunch more. You have to do all those same combinations here, and if none of those work, you have to do all those same combinations here. Now, one of those combinations has got to work if it's factorable, if it's possible to factor this quadratic. If there are tons of quadratics that you can't factor. They just don't work out. The numbers don't work out. So if it's factorable, one of these would have to work. But looks like the maximum number of times we could try if we're just randomly guessing and checking all the different possible combinations. 12. 12? How do you get 12? Because 4, uh, or 4 for that one. 4? Yeah, 4. Uh, well, there's 8, but not eight. It. But you can pretty much just say there's 4. Because if you do negative and make and a 2 and 11, and yeah. it's not a totally different answer, and then it's the other one's not going to work either. Okay. So basically, if you do all three of them, you're going to have the maximum of the 12. Okay, basically. that's good. You, you, you remember something about if 2 and 11 don't work, then negative 2 and 11 aren't going to work. Just switching that side is not going to work. It's whatever you got for that number is the opposite of that number is what you're going to get. If you didn't remember that, then you're looking at 24 different guesses and check, checks. And guesses and checks. Which taken a shot in the dark with each of those. But with this, though it's maybe not as straightforward, it's definitely going to get you there. If you can't find two numbers that multiply to make negative 396 and add to 21, you just know it's not factorable. There's nothing you can be done. Right? But if you don't do that, if you don't go it that way, you could try 24 different combinations, and only after none of them work, you know it's not factorable. And let's be realistic, we're human beings. So let's say we get all through 24 of them and none of them work. Are you just going to think like, okay, I did everything correctly and now I know it's not factorable. No, you're going to think, you're going to think in one of those 24 combinations you did something incorrectly and now you're going to go back and check your work. Okay? Whereas in here, if you think, well, I did something wrong, all you have to do is go back through the factors of negative 396 and make sure that none of them adds up to 21. Right? It's a lot of work, but a lot less work than this. Into my commercial. Make sure you're all gonna submit your not easy easy things, especially with all this thing here. So for that, you can do that. You guys all watch commercials? Do you know? Infomercials? I love it. Anyway, um, any questions from from that? Anything generally you didn't understand? Any specific problem with the homework you didn't get? 26. 26? We talked about this idea uh, a couple times at least today, but um, we'll just be reminded of it. The first thing you should do when factoring any quadratic or any polynomial of any kind, you probably don't know what polynomial means yet, that's okay. Um, but a quadratic, you're going to factor a quadratic. The first thing you should do before anything else is to see if all of the, the all the terms in the quadratic, this one and this one and this one, see if they all have a common factor. If you don't, then you just make it more work for yourself. If you can find a common factor and undistribute that common factor, it'll make your work a lot easier. So is there anything that all three of these have in common? Okay, three. Three. They all have a factor. Anything else? Like 
Three goes into it, so maybe six going to all of them. If you're not sure, you can just factor out the three and see if you can factor out something else from the result. So we undistribute the three, which means we're gonna fill these parentheses. So if we were to distribute the three to what we're writing down, we get the original back. So three times what is 12 m squared? Four. Four m squared. Okay. And how about for 36? Three times what? Nine squared. 12 m. And three times. Nine will give us 27. To make sure we did it right, we just go back and distribute the three back in there and see if we get the original. All right, is there anything that, that these have in common? Can we factor out something else? No, no. No. Uh, three, maybe these two have three in common, and these two have four in common, but they don't all three have the same thing in common. Okay? So now we use what I've come to call the AC method. A times C, put a B there. What's A times C give us? 36. 36. A is the number that's multiplied by the square variable, and uh, the C is just a constant, so it gives us 36. And B is negative 12, so it's right there. Always A, B, and C. So what are we looking for here? Why that? Because it equals negative 12 and it also equals 36. If we add them together, it equals negative 12, and we multiply them together, we get positive 36. Okay, good. So what do we do with that negative 6 and that negative 6? What? Plug them in. Put them in front of a house. Plug them in how exactly? We don't like to plug them in for M, right? Replace what? Which ones? This one? Replace AC. Well, AC is just is just four times nine. Thirty-six. Something gets replaced by negative six and negative six. What gets replaced by negative six and negative six? Well, not quite. It would replace the m. Negative six m minus six oh, m. Right? Oh. Negative twelve m can be written as negative six m minus six m. Okay. Now we did all that work to find exactly the right numbers to split negative twelve into. Because if we had done it some other way, then this next step won't work out. The key thing here is we're going to look at this as a group. This as a group, including that negative there. So we have three, nine. Okay. And in this group, what are we looking for? Things to distribute out of. Things to, yeah, so undistribute. What things can we undistribute from these two? Two. Two. Anything else? M. Also M, right? We could we could redistribute an M in there and So, 2m times what? Negative needs to give us 4m squared. 2m. 2m. Then we're going to distribute it to the second thing to get negative 6m. Negative 3. Negative 3. 2m times negative 3 is negative 6m. So we just, from these two, undistributed is 2m. Factored out of 2m. Same thing here. We're looking for, in these two terms, what do they have in common? What can we undistribute from these two? Since this first one's negative, like we would like the first thing in the parentheses to wind up being positive. So if we factor out a negative three, okay, then we can allow this first thing to be positive and get multiplied by negative, have a negative three distributed. So what goes here? Two, two m. Negative three times two m is negative six m. And here, a negative three. So that negative three times negative three is positive. Now this
this term and this term have a 2m minus 3 in common, so we undistribute the 2m minus 3. What would we have to distribute that to to get 2m times 2m minus 3? We'd have to distribute it to a 2m. And what about here? What would we have to multiply, uh, multiply by to get negative 3 times 2m minus 3? We'd have to multiply by that negative 3. And we could write this a little shorter because 2m minus 3 times 2m minus 3, that's just one thing times itself. When you're multiplying something times itself, it's called squaring. 2m minus 3 squared. quickly because it's very similar to 26. What was the first thing I said you should look for when you're factoring a quadratic? That's right. So we're always going to check. Maybe it won't have anything, but maybe it will. And maybe one more time. So is there anything that they all have in common? Okay. A 4. At least a 4. We'll start there. 5x squared plus Now we see there's nothing that those those like the new quadratic, nothing that these all have in common. Okay. Like this is prime, this is prime, so definitely not. And remember that AC method again. AC. Before you do anything, you could always write that. You could get it on the rubber stamp and stamp every homework problem with AC here, X, B there. It's it's numbers and specific numbers that are different. What does A times C give us here? 30. 35 times 6 is 30. 31D. If you multiply by get 30 and add to get 31. 1 and 30. 1 and 30. 4 times 5x squared plus 30x plus 1x plus 6. Together. Here's a group. Here's another group. What does this group have in common? Five. 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 And an x. So if we multiplied x by 5x, we get 5x squared. Multiplied 6 by 5x, we get 30x. Plus, the only thing these two have in common is 1. We don't say they have 1, just 1 in common. Now, because we did all our work correctly, x plus 6 is a common factor for both of those. When I say both, I mean this one and this second one. They have x plus 6 in common. So we undistribute that x plus 6, and we have to distribute that to a 5x and a 1 to get this. And there it is, factor. here, so I'm going to have you pass in your homework.
terms of a previous equation where we want to get the variable by itself. We want to do the inverse operations of the operations that are being done here. So if it was s plus 2 equals 9, we would subtract 2 on both sides and get s equals 7. If it was 2s equals 16, we would divide by 2 on both sides and get 8. If it was Subtraction, we would counteract that with addition. If it was uh, if it was division, we would counteract that with multiplication. If it was multiplication by a fraction, we might divide by that fraction and multiply by its reciprocal, or all those things. So, so far we've we've undone or we've counteracted, we've canceled out addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Okay. Now we have this square root. Right. So how do you quote undo the square? inverse of squared. Square root, okay? At the very least, it's a good guess. Right? Squares and square roots. Squaring means multiply a number by itself. Square root means something times itself as that number. Bound is really similar. Okay. Let's see if taking the square root of s will leave s. Is the square root of s square to s? That's what we want to know. What's the square root of 16? Four. Why is the square root of 16 four? Four times four is 16. It gives you that thing that gives you the square root. Okay. So is the square root of s squared s? Yes. Why? s squared is s times s. Yes, yes, yes. Because s times s gives you that thing that gives you the square root of s squared. So take the square root of the other side. Okay. Now it gets more than that. Uh, let's think about the very original equation that we had up here, s squared equals 25. We're looking for the solution to this equation. Would you agree? Okay. Remember how, how many times we talked about the definition of the solution. What does it mean to find the solution to an equation? What, who says that? What the equation says is true when you do what? When you input a number, input the number into where the variable is, right? Okay. So, who says the solution is five? Solution is five. Okay. What about the solution is five? Is it the solution? A solution is five. A solution is five. It could be negative five. It could be positive. It could be negative. Solution, the solution is not correct anymore. All right, just think about what we said at the beginning, or a minute ago, at the beginning of this mini discussion. The solution is a number that when you plug it in, it's true. The equation is true. They weren't very specific here. They're leaving it wide open for us. Any number that will multiply by itself and get 25 will suffice. So 5, 5 times 5 is 25. Negative 5. Negative 5 times negative 5 is 
also a positive for the factory. So we have two solutions. Which is not surprising because we've been finding two solutions for these for most of these quadratic equations. And it has to do with the fact that some the, like a positive number and a negative number can square to get the same number. So Using this idea of taking the square root to undo the square, I'm going to give you a, an equation. And I want you to solve. Solve for whatever variable it is. Let me see. Can you give you? Okay. We'll start off pretty simple. Six. The value or values of z that will satisfy the equation, if the equation is true. Which we, I just learned about this idea of using the square root to do the square of our number. Let's start off with uh, the step one that I see a lot of you doing. I just learned about this, taking the square root idea. So, take the square root. Okay, not a bad idea. Only, what are we writing here? What is the square root of 6z squared? That should be some decimal. Yeah, yeah. What, what's the square root of? 2.4-ish, right? Because it goes on forever. Yeah. The thing that, that most people miss when they make this mistake is that is to write like uh, that the square root is 6z, or maybe it's 3z, or whatever. But the truth is, whatever you write here, how do you know it's the square root? What would you have to do with it to get 6z squared? Yeah, you would have to multiply this by itself to get 6z squared, which this wouldn't do it. Right? That would give 36z squared. 3z wouldn't do it. That would give you 9z squared. You'd have to have 2.4 whatever forever to get 6. But the z part would do that. z times z would be z squared. So it's causing some complications that maybe we can avoid. So maybe avoid the complications of taking the square root of 6. Tyler? Could you take a 6 and divide it into 150? You could divide both sides by 6. Okay. If we divide this side by 6, 6 divided by 6 is 1, so we just get z squared. What's 150 divided by 6? 25. 25. Which is the square root. Which is conveniently <laughs> perfect square, so we take the square root of both sides. And then there's 5. 5? Only 5? Plus no, 9. Five. So minus Five is a solution, negative five is the other solution. And these are the only solutions. Only two. Okay. Maybe we'll do this try. Here's gonna make one up.
take the square root right away. Yeah. Let's make sure that that works out. Right, thinking that we get our system. All right. We justify that. Can we using the definition of squares and square roots proves to me that the square root of x plus two squared is x plus two. Why? Because if you wrote it out, it's x plus two times x minus two. Okay. Right. The square root of sixteen is four because four times four is sixteen. The square root of x plus 2 squared is x plus 2 because x plus 2 times x plus 2 is x plus 2 squared. So it is x plus 2 times x plus 2. So yes, that is the square root of x plus 2 squared. Square root of 16. <coughs> 4. Just 4. Plus 4 minus 4. Okay. Because if this quantity, this whole thing, comes out to be 4, what are you going to do with it? You're going to square it. And if you square 4, you get 16. If you square negative 4, you get 16. So x plus 2, that whole thing, could be equal to 4 or negative 4. Now, you need to keep in mind, this represents two different equations when I write plus or minus 2. It's a short way to write two equations. What's one of the equations? x plus 2 equals 4. And the other one? Right. It represents that it, that it equals two quantities. So when we go to finish this, e this out and find the solution, we need to remember that, well, what are we going to do to get x by itself here? Subtract 2, subtract 2. When we say subtract 2 from this side, we really, really mean subtract 2 from 4, subtract 2 from negative 4. And you don't have to write that down, but do keep in mind you need to do two different things. 4 minus 2 and negative 4 minus 2. So how many solutions do we have? 2, and they are? 2, and 4 minus 2 is 2, and negative 4 minus 2 is negative 6. Now, think about the square root x. It's kind of nice, because... We don't have to mess with all that back thing, do we? We don't have to multiply stuff out. We don't have to distribute parentheses with other parentheses. We don't have to factor. We don't have to make one side equal zero. All we need to do is if we see something squared, even a parentheses squared, just get that parentheses squared, that x squared, that z squared, all alone, all isolated by itself, and then we can just cancel out the square root of the square root. Take the square root of the square root. Or take the square root of the square. And in that, that step, it becomes, well, I think a little bit easier. That's pretty, pretty nice. Um, so let's say you've got it. You, you, can, you can isolate the square thing, take the square root. Um, now, just for the sake of Does 150 have a square root? I remember it's you. Yeah. No. Does it have a does it have a square root? No. No, it does not have a square root. Uh, well, yeah. I mean, it has a square root, but it's gonna be like rational. Not yes. It's not a perfect square. Yeah. Okay. It's not a perfect square. It doesn't have a perfect square root. All right. Uh. So what we want to do is simplify it. If, if if we have the square root of 2, it's just, there's nothing we can do about it. Let's leave it like that. Okay? It's exact. It's saying exactly the number that multiplies by itself and gets exactly 2. To write a decimal for that would be not exact. It would be approximate. So we'll leave it as the square root, but we might be able to simplify it. And here's how. Okay? Uh, let's say we do 25 times 6. Now, what do you notice about 25? Here's something we can do with square roots. So if we have a square root, a big square root of one number times another, we can separate it as the square root of the first times the square root of the second. Now, this one's just kind of done for. It's just the square root of six. It's not going to look any nicer. But 
square root of 25 is 5. So we can write it as 5 times the square root of 6. Instead of the square root of this huge number, we should do 5 times the square root of 6. A little more manageable, a little more we need to do something with this, a little easier to work with, and so on. So there's square root of uh, 13 over 4. So the same way that we can split up a product, we can split up a quotient. We take the product, the square root of the big product, and we can split it up into the product of two square roots. We can write this as the square root of 13 over the square root of 4. We get the square root of 13. up in our answer to get something like uh, the square root of 18 over the square root of 11. The square root of 18 over the square root of 11. Make the square root of 18 over the square root of 11. And that works out nicely here because we make this the square root of 9 times the square root of 2. And now we have 3 root 2. Simplified square root of 18. But now, because of old timey math guys, we don't leave a square root in the middle. Okay? And for no other reason than it might show up on your standardized test, I'm going to teach you about this thing called rationalizing the denominator. Okay. Rationalizing because we're making the denominator a rational number. Right now it's irrational. 11 doesn't have a square root, a nice square root. It's a decimal that goes on forever and doesn't repeat. It doesn't have any pattern. So the way we make the denominator rational is to, let's rewrite it over here. Similar to finding like a common denominator, we can multiply the numerator and denominator by anything we want. So if we can multiply by something that will make this a rational number, then that's what we want. We multiply the denominator by the square root of 11, and we have to multiply the numerator as well. What's the square root of 11 times the square root of 11? The square root of 121, which is? 11. Right? Think about the square root of 11 is a number. When you take that number, the square root of 11, and you multiply it by itself, what should you get? 11. There it is, a number that when you multiply it by itself, you get 11. And a number when you multiply it by itself, you get 11. We're multiplying it by itself, we should get 11. Keep, you can just get rid of the square root. If you multiply square root by its identical copy, you get itself. Right? And this is the square root of 22, which can't be simplified. So 3 root 22 over 11. Now, I think it's kind of outdated to do this, but we're still doing it. I'm not writing the test, I'm not writing the standards. It's still a standard. We still learn things. There's still stuff wrapped up in this. We still. So 4.5, you write it down there. 